Welcome to the BeCheck Chats, where I get to interview some of the most interesting and talented founders in the Web3 space. Today, I'm very happy to be speaking with Vale Jones and Safa, the founders of Tally Labs, the company under which Jenkins the Vale and Azabala is being built, and who are at the forefront of giving people the power to turn their IP into characters. Guys, thank you very much for joining me today. How are you doing? Doing great. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, that was that was one of the most kind intros I think we've ever received. So we really yeah. appreciate it. Great. So the, one of the one of the main reasons I was just telling you guys off air that I really really wanted to speak to you was because um, I actually did a podcast with Spacewalk, who I know both of you are familiar with. Kind of runs his own podcast and newsletter in the space. And there were so many questions which I started asking him that he was just like. Do you know what? Maybe you should just speak to the guys yourself because he was like gushing about the projects and the way that you've gone about building them and sort of saying like, I don't know, the way that you keep the community engaged, the way you do these sorts of things. And I was like, I was constantly asking, well, why do you think they went about it like this? Why do you think? And he was just like, I think this, but you know, maybe you should speak to yourself. And I also know Filmbook, who I know works with you guys now. And so I had to message Filmbook to be like, look, I would love to speak to you to find out more kind of from a founder's perspective, how you've gone about building this community and your products, because I think as we kind of just noted as well in space, there's so many people and so many types of projects going on and um, it's, it's, it's very difficult to keep a good positive sentiment in space over a long period of time. And you guys are definitely up there with uh, have, having been able to achieve that. So I was one just going to ask. Go one thing I will say is if there's anyone outside of Tally Labs that's like qualified to speculate on what we're up to, I don't think there's anyone better to do it than Spacewalk. He is like, sometimes he'll say things and we'll be like, oh, are you like in our meetings somehow? Like, are you flying <laughs> like he just, he spent all, he, he just gets it. He's a really sharp guy and has spent like a lot of time digging in and, and we're grateful for it. Yeah, I lo- really like having conversations with him because he's sort of, he, he the the thinking that he does he's like trying to push the space forward in in the thinking um and i guess that's what you know one of the main things you guys are trying to do as well um one of the things that he constantly mentioned was how you were had a really great understanding of the community and just kind of taking it back a little bit what what in your backgrounds kind of prepared you for this space do you think yeah um it's super interesting because you know and and we and we we should give our backgrounds and talk about them i'm sure there's some professional experience that that we've both had that has helped us but um beyond that uh we're community members you know like like we we didn't come into this space uh thinking about how to start a project or how to make some money or how to drop some nfts we came into the space because we really believed in it. We uh, thought that that participating in Web3, owning NFTs, joining communities, uh, hanging out with people on the internet was like the type of stuff that w- we like to do. Um, Safa and I are childhood best friends. And so we always you know, have done stuff together. And I think that probably the most important thing, um, and even beyond like our professional experiences, is that uh that starting as community members and and having you know been in those shoes for so long so that when we do work um obviously through tally labs the first thing that we always ask ourselves is how we would feel about that as a community member and and you know now we're super fortunate to have such an incredible community that we don't only need to ask ourselves uh we can we can ask and respond to what our existing community wants as well what what were the first communities that you joined then that you really enjoyed being a part of and it kind of made you think okay there's something cool about just being in this community um i think like most people top shot was like sort of the the first and and, and top shot has like you know a good community but I, I wouldn't necessarily say like i or we were like drawn to it for the community i think we were sort of drawn to it for like the use case of like digital ownership and being it being served to us through something that like we're both passionate about which is basketball but obviously from top shot you go down the rabbit hole further and you know you get rugged on a bunch of projects and you buy a bunch of stuff that's nowhere to be found now 
Uh, but we were both sort of fortunate. I think a lot of people in the space who entered around that time were just like, frankly, like lucky, right? Like we sort of came in right as like apes and NFT Twitter were like talking about apes. And you really had to, um, like you really had to try like not to scroll your timeline and see stuff about board apes. And so um, we were fortunate that it was really like one of the first communities that we sort of immersed ourselves in um, and, and became sort of like fell in love with, right. In terms of just like the support and the passion and um, we'll never forget, like, you know, upon purchasing an ape back then, it's like your DMS are just immediate, immediately flooded with welcome ape noises, welcome brother. Like it's just, it was a whole thing. And, and uh, it was really exciting, you know, for us. And, and uh, it's funny, they had the spaces last night celebrating a million followers. And the, mm. the most common thing that I saw on the timeline was, wow, this, like the vibes and how good this is feels like early BA. It feels like a year ago, you know, 15 mm-hmm. months ago when, when people were just excited and celebratory and, and happy. Do you think, because one of the things I always reflect on, like I saw all the ape stuff happen and just didn't participate because I really didn't, I had no, I mean, I was interested in the space I'd been in since early 2021 and I'd come in for buying a, bit, a little bit of art every now and again, but I didn't necessarily see any precedent for, something taking off to such the degree that that did look I know it's easy in hindsight to say that you're kind of genius investors and um kind of having your pulse on where things are going but when did you think even with the board apes in particular that this was going to go to the to the moon in in the way that they did or did did you even think that I, I would say definitely not. <laughs> like we, we're not genius investors. That's, that's the honest uh, answer. <laughs> yeah, totally right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hold on, can we rewind so I can? <laughs> smart. Uh, I'll edit that up. <laughs> yeah, perfect. No, but but I think like uh, you know we what we noticed was how passionate the community was, and um, my background uh, is is in software and product management, Safa comes from a brand strategy, uh, creative marketing background. Um, and bo- in both of those fields, community matters a ton. And what was happening with Bored Apes in, in April and May and June of 2021 jumped out to both of us as, as a thing that felt really special. I don't think anybody could possibly have imagined that the 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 board ape nfts that they purchased would end up being worth you know close to half a million dollars or anything like that um and i think what and you know you actually see that the proof that no one believed that was clear as the total you know there's a time early where where what what the community paid attention to was the unique owners and unique mm-hmm. owners like continued to climb and I remember it was a huge milestone when we passed like 3,000 unique owners and then 4,000 unique owners. And I remember we passed 5,000 unique owners. And it was a huge deal. Like the average person owned less than two board apes. Mm. If you knew that it was going to go up, you would have held them. <laughs> and so um, everybody was just, uh, it was so welcoming, right? And the idea that unique owners was going up meant that new people were joining the ecosystem. When we named Jenkins the valet and started posting content as Jenkins, it wasn't because we thought that the asset would go up in value and we could start a business off of it. The very first like inkling that we ever had was that we just wanted to contribute to this like vibrant community. Um, and so I, I wonder if actually the reason that it did happen the way it happened and the reason that the collection and the individual NFTs did go up in value is because everybody just thought to themselves, I want to contribute to this vibrant community. And when everybody works like that, the success, you know, like the mainstream or the monetary success is, is like a follow on effect rather than like what you're focusing on. Yeah, it's really interesting. So you mentioned Jenkins the Valet. I want to ask you a little bit about that just to kind of set up what that is and how, why you first decided to create that. But just, just before that, I, I guess that, so you're saying that wasn't on your mind in particular when you first bought in, right? The first stage was noticing a community, noticing pa- a group of passionate people gathering around something. At what point did you think, okay, we've been given these IP licenses. This could be revolutionary in some way. Was that, how far along was it until that kind of, that light came on in your mind? I think the light came on fairly quick. Obviously, like we chose to do this with a board ape, right? Because they had been the ones to pioneer. And, and of course, like everything that we do, 
you know, we like to have the mindset of like, what if this goes exactly as we hope it does that that's mm. still today, right? Like with, with features that we drop or, you know, you know, different community stuff. Um, but obviously I think at the same time, we were also like viewing it as a creative outlet and, and trying to, I distinctly remember, we were both sort of saying to ourselves, like, let's just try and do more stuff like for fun without massive expectations. Um, but, uh, but we were sort of intentional about obviously choosing a project that not only had a great community, but had really awesome commercial rights and, and sort of, we were hell bent on like exploring those and really pushing it to, to the boundaries of like what it could be. Um, we saw a lot of people, you know, putting their ape on, on cookies, on wine, on merch and, and absolutely no disrespect to that. But we felt, what if we actually went a layer deeper and like built a real character, did real exploration, gave him a real voice and like brought people into this world before trying to do any of that and before trying to monetize it. Um, so we were very much like in that space for a while where we were just like, let's, let's explore this, let's build this character and like, let's make Jenkins as widely known as we possibly can. Um, that's and then really from cool. there, the opportunity of a project sort of like come into focus. Okay. So we started with like a Twitter character who was, I guess, tweeting about his, it was just bu- building that character in a particular way. What, what, how did you decide what type of character he would take on? And then how did the writer's room NFT come about after that? Yeah. Um, how how you decide on the character is sort of a funny thing. Uh, the the one of the things that I think we think is really special about what Yuga Labs did when they created the Board API Club is at the time really the most popular NFT avatars were CryptoPunks. Yes, and Board Apes were like a step up in le- in terms of like the fidelity of the artwork, and so uh, many of them look like they have stories to tell because of because of their like cartoon nature and what they're wearing versus pixelated art um we love punks 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 you know are are iconic um but they just are different than than board apes and uh ape 1798 uh who is now jenkins the valet uh he looks like a valet you know the outfit <laughs> like he is there's just no ape in the collection that, that looks more like they would be uh out front waiting to like grab your yacht keys than than that ape. <laughs> and um my my I studied creative writing um, in college and and you know never became a professional or anything like that but 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 write every day and uh, one of the things that I think is really special about writing and, and even folks who don't like write you know fiction or anything like that probably still have this experience if they if they you know journal or, or write their intentions or anything like that but when you sit down and you like start to write you don't necessarily like have anything in mind you just go. And, uh, and, and Saf and I had this idea about, uh, a board ape that could be a character. Uh, this ape looked like the valet. Um, and, uh, I like wrote for a little bit, uh, and what came out was this idea that, that, uh, Jenkins, mom cried when he got his job as the head valet at the yacht club, because, uh no one in his family had ever worked before it's like a big deal like they're from the other side of the swamp they're not like you know the other the other apes and so um jenkins got the job and and he's desperate to like hold on to it and do a great job and so what that means is when other apes come to him and they've got these like uh requests from him he never turns them down uh and he's practiced discretion for a really long time but, uh, and, and remember the idea was to contribute back to the community. And so the idea that we had with building this character was how can we use a character that other people will be able to interact with? Like, how can we make this something fun for all ape holders? And so uh, the story sort of ends this introduction to Jenkins as being like, Jenkins has always practiced discretion. He's done all these odd jobs for other characters, but, um, but now he's gonna like, he, he, he's, he's got these offers to tell, to like spill the secrets. Uh, and he's going to do it. And so it was an invitation to other ape holders at the time to tell us information about their characters so that Jenkins could help bring them to life. And so what we did over the next few weeks from there was um, we posted a form, hundreds of other ape holders wrote in and told us like information about their characters. And Jenkins, um, you know, told the story of the odd jobs that he had done for these different characters. And it happened incredibly organically. The expectation like wasn't that we would have all sorts of demand for people 
to tell us about their characters that Jenkins would end up writing. The idea was just to to define this interesting character who's the valet at the yacht club and like see what comes from it. And I think what we did back then and what we continue to do today with Tally Labs um, and everything we do is is uh, we launch something, we see the response, we see the feedback, we listen to the community members, and we take the next step in the direction that makes the most sense for what folks are doing and what they enjoy and what they want to get out of it. And in this case, and Safa can talk about the introduction of the writer's room, but in this case, what we learned was that this thesis that we had that like characters could could be born on the blockchain was coming true because of the number of people who wanted to interact with Jenkins to have like their own stories told. Yeah, that's fascinating. It seems like a really smart mix between kind of creative writing as a creative outlet and kind of business community feedback oriented so you're creating these stories but also doing it in a way where it's like making sure that you have kind of a product market fit at the same time and I can imagine that if you did one without the other it it wouldn't necessarily it wouldn't necessarily be as smooth a process but because you're fusing these two things together you're getting all this feedback from the people at the same time uh Safa did you want to speak to the writers room a little bit yeah, for sure. And and one other note, just on the on the feedback, I know at the beginning you mentioned like, or you asked about our backgrounds. I think um, uh, while VJ is like a million percent correct that a lot of the mindset that we have was formed through just like being community members. Um, in, in our past careers, we also spent a lot of time like digging into consumers and like how they feel, right? Like VJ mm. was in product and, and, and as a, you know, in product, like your only job is to build for users and, and hear what users want, take it in and like build. Um, and then in marketing, similarly, later, it's all about tapping into like consumer psychology and, and messaging things in a way that that will be best received. So those two skill sets and those two like different types of listening to the community, I think, came together really nicely and, and inform a lot of how we how we do stuff now, um, where, you know, yeah. VJ and, and, and honestly, a lot of our team who have that background are, are, are bringing really interesting ideas to the table right through a, through a product and user experience lens. And I'm bringing things to the table through a marketing lens and we're like merging them to find something awesome. Um, so just, I think that's just, cool. just quickly yeah. on on those two very specific experiences which I think are, I can see why they're so uh, important in this space what what do you think that maybe one or two key learnings are that you've transferred from those previous uh, your previous careers into this space and you've thought if we didn't apply that this would just not have run as well or this was the most important thing that we applied yeah, I'll obviously should obviously speak to his. For me, one thing that's been interesting is is in sort of traditional web two marketing, um, people have been waking up to uh, sort of uh, like see through advertising, uh, mm-hmm. where you know you do paid ads on like a social platform, you get a promoted post, and then like you you know essentially you're paying like Facebook per click. Yeah, uh, people that, don't want it, do they? Yeah, that in Web2 is like starting to phase out and people have been starting to look more and more for like organic content. And and there's this saying that like brands should should treat themselves more like media companies and put out like valuable mm. content for their consumers. That's just like awesome and organic. Um, notice that happening even like before entering Web3. In Web3, like paid content is just like not a thing. Like if you're scrolling your timeline and you see like an ad, you immediately <laughs> scroll past it and it feels like a red flag. It's all yeah, about organic. It's all organic content. So, uh, that, that's been like useful for us. Um, it's been, it's been fun to, to explore that and, and, and really challenge ourselves to, to put out content that is like our community will like, and, and not hide behind like, you know, a pay per click model. It's been a blast to do too. Like, it's fun. You know, when, when you, when you, uh, when you start to think about what it's like to, to communicate in that way, uh, like the possibilities are endless because, because everything becomes a story, which is really fun. Um, mine, mine from the product side is, uh, it's going to probably sound basic, but like, it is just the truth. Um, uh, listen to your users, uh, build what they need quickly and then like, see how it goes and change based off of that. Like that, that, that's the model. Uh, it's really hard to convince yourself to do something. Or sorry, it's really easy to convince yourself to do something otherwise because there's always like a million pressures to do something else. Mm. But if you just stay true to that, then you have a great shot. 
And, uh, and, and by the way, like it really is so much easier said than done. There's not a day that goes by where, where, and we have a, we have a team. I am, I am far from the best like product thinker on our team. Um, uh, we have an amazing head of product who goes by robes and an amazing head of engineering who goes by OP who are, who are incredible. Um, there's a, there's not a day that goes by though, where, where you can't be convinced to do something else. And so I think just as we, we try to always remind ourselves that uh, we're here for our community members. They tell us things and they take actions that give us feedback and we need to respond to that feedback. And if we do that over and over again, we'll be successful. Yeah, I think, I mean, both of those make a lot of sense. Like my, my reflection on that, and we will get to the NFT, but I'm just, I, I want to dive into that a bit more because one of the things I think I've noticed about your community more is that you've managed to build up this positive equity where I, I know on one level people think you you might be able to like make something change make something change but if you do that too much then in this space people are so damn impatient um and just the attention spans of people in the space is is difficult to maintain and if you take too long then that it's also difficult to maintain mm -hmm. and so I just wanted to ask like how you've thought about these periods of time where maybe nothing is happening to like what you've managed to do to create a community that is like, no, nah, these guys, these guys have got it. Like we're okay with them taking some time because that is definitely not the case in many other communities who either lose face or attention for whatever reason. It sounds cliche, but I think we, we, uh, we just do it as, as if like we would want it to be in the exact way we would want it to be done to us. Like if we were community members, um, when things are great and there's like massive announcements and like, our NFTs are flying off the shelves. We don't talk about floor price. Um, when things are like horrible and things are never horrible, but like when things are slow, uh, <laughs> we don't like, we don't talk about floor price. Like you would never be able to tell. Um, I think when we make decisions, potentially decisions that like have an impact on the product, we go to really great lengths to explain like the rationale behind the decisions um, mm. and like really long medium posts, explain why we felt that it's the right decision for the community uh, potential other options we were considering. We never just like drop stuff on, on people and surprise them. Uh, we do our best to, 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 you know, bring things to a vote, like when we can, you know, and a good example is like the podcast community. Um, and then also we were just like fortunate in that. I think we went to market as like a utility project in a sea of like PFPs. And it really forced us to, to think about how we can be different and how we can, um, how we can, you know, make it a really awesome experience for people like in between sort of like tentpole announcements. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, you know, it's probably one of the things that we, we, we stress about the most, right? We have an awesome community, but we want to deliver things faster. We're like, we want it, we want to deliver them ASAP for people because we do have such an awesome community, but we also try and let them know that, um, like we're playing a really long game, right? And, and five years from now, uh, a, a difference in a month may not feel like, like a ton. And we, we owe it to them to like bring the best possible thing to market. Yeah. yeah. Th there's also this, there's also like a couple levels to it. Like we we listening to your users and iterating as quickly as possible is the key to i think like um shipping good products but it's all happening within a mission that has not changed since the day we started writing as jenkins the valet which is that characters and stories and worlds and really like the next huge franchises will come to market on the internet first and that communities will craft those stories together. And our community believes that too. And uh, folks who don't believe that have like, have, have left the community. And folks who do believe that have joined the community. And we all agree that that's what we're trying to do. How that happens, how you go from, you know, today to a decade from now, there's, dozens of different paths and many of them have dead ends at the end and our perspective is that listening and working with the community and watching the things that matter most to them is the way that you keep taking steps forward and not hitting a dead end but we're still constrained within the vision that we all share which is that that this is the way that the best stories will be told you know in the future and so i think when we when we come from that place of agreement um it's not like we're constantly pivoting and like, you know, there's always a new interesting thing in the NFT space. We're not going to like grab each of those things and, and confuse the community about what we're here for. 
we're here for a very clear thing within the scope of that thing, how we get there, you know, inevitably will change. How have you, so taking that very clear goal, like, look, you want to tell the best stories and this is the way we're going to do that. How have you gone about executing on that to date? Maybe this gives you the chance to uh, talk about the roadmap to date. And then how do you think about taking on that huge task uh, moving forward? I think it you start by even defining like what a story means. And I think we define mm. it as like something slightly different than than others. Like we consider a story to be like more of a holistic experience that sort of like follows you as you interact with everything that we do. It could be that you see something on Twitter. It could be that you see something on Discord. It could be an interaction you take with like a product that we build. So uh, we think the story like doesn't, it's not just sort of like you passively consuming things that like we write or animate. It's it's like everything. And, and ultimately, generally all of the stories that we tell culminate with like a software experience that you interact with to really bring it home. So I think we're one of the most unique companies in the space. We always say it's it's hard to be a storytelling company. It's hard to be a software company. It's like really hard to be both. But if you can be both, then like, I think we think that it, it, it raises the ceiling of like what you can accomplish. Um, so I think we're like highly collaborative between all of our different departments. I think we're one of the only companies in the space where you have a head of story who's a Netflix screenwriter, you know, on a call with a head of engineering and a head of product with like consumer tech backgrounds. And, and, and the type of company culture we have is that, um, people have their lanes, but like good ideas can come from anywhere. Right. So story might have an awesome idea that might spark something in product's mind to go build product might have an awesome idea that story then, you know, build something around. And so I think it's, it's like that culture and it's that sort of fusing of like software and, and understanding that when you build awesome stuff, like you can tell better stories, um, and, and really iterating on what that looks like. I think that's, that's one way that we've, we've sort of accomplished it or, or hopefully are on our way to accomplishing it. How are you finding that difficulty? I, th I think you both said that neither of you are from tech backgrounds necessarily. So knowing that at least, I don't know, if you think of your company as two components, part story, part software, what have the challenges been leading a company that is at least half something that you're not like fully familiar with in that respect? Yeah. Uh, so neither of us are software engineers, but both of us have spent our careers in technology, um, and and certainly in you know in product management, your entire job is software development. You're just not writing the code. Um, we uh, we're really fortunate. I mean, our our head of engineering, um, OP, is is a really special person. Um, and, and he's, uh, he's talented. He's an incredible software engineer. Um, and he's an incredible communicator. Uh, he works really closely with our head of product robes. Um, he works really closely with us and we, we all, um, we prioritize everything we do uh, about what's best for the community member, what will, you know, make the best story, what will make the most engaging experience. And we have all the trust in the world in OP that uh, it will it will be built to deliver the experience that we've defined together. Um, there's a there's a way that you work with 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 in software engineering, um, and not everyone who works in that process is writing code, but everyone who works in that process has a role that helps define like what something will be. And um, we're fortunate to have had that work experience before starting Tally Labs. So we know how we all fit together. What What about the other, because you've made some interesting hires in the sense that, and this is something I was speaking to Filmbook and Spacewalk about, how you, you went for, because I guess, the as you said completely rightly, that there are, the people that you put in the places means that you're able to concentrate on X while they're just off doing Y, mm -hmm. and you've got trust in them to do that. You, you also hired, I think, ThreadGuy to be the director of Vibes, which I think is a position which I don't know when when did this when did this appear across was it maybe last year it started to appear as a first it might have started as community manager then it kind of shifted into his vibes territory um why did you think that's so important really good question I think um you you make a good point it's sort of sort of been around the, the name mm. has changed 
honestly, like the level of respect that like the position deserve mm. is, is getting, it's like changed and is, is, is fully, you know, the space is fully realized that, that it's important. Um, uh, thread guy's a beast. He's like wise beyond his years. He's, uh, this is publicly out there. I'm not, I'm not doxing him. He's, he's 20 years old and he's like more mature than, than like us in some ways. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, I was a knucklehead when I was 20. So, um, 20. 20. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. a beast. He's like super driven. Um, he just, he just gets it. And, um, I think the first director vibes that comes to mind for me is D's from fractional who really yeah. sort of like pioneered the position. Um, mm-hmm. but the space is just like all about vibes. It's all about shit posting. It's all about like taking the current events of the space and sort of translating them into like a fun way that resonates with people. Um, and especially you talk about, you know, how as a community, we keep our folks engaged and entertained during like slower eras it's or slower periods it's through vibes right it's through engaging them and a number of other things and so having someone like tg who's whose primary focus is to think what does the community want and how can how can we give it to them and how can i stay tapped in and, and just provide good vibes is like it's just really invaluable for us and so um we give him a lot of a lot of trust and um and and know that he uh, he's, he's gonna, you know, he's gonna do what he does and, and, and requires like very, like we would never even try and like tell him what to do because he just gets it so well. Um, so we, uh, we met him. He, he's now not thread guy. The first thread he, he ever wrote was on Jenkins and Tally Labs. Oh, was it? <laughs> after, after his, his PFP was a G vol before it was a mutant. And he had like a couple thousand followers. And we were just like amazed at the level of insight. We didn't know anything about him at the time um, and really built like a really organic relationship with him. Mm. And then ultimately felt like it was time to, to bring him on board as we scaled the team. Thread guy is, um, is, is like one of the most special people I've ever met. Uh, and, and, and I, I want, you should talk to thread guy, you know, in yeah, the, in the train of, 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 of yeah. baseball says Todd Gosden. But I, I think actually, you know, having conversations with, 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 uh, honestly, any member of Thai labs would be, would be, um, probably fun and an interesting perspective, but I won't tell too much like personal information about thread guy, but, but we've obviously gotten to know him quite well as he works at Thai labs. And, um, Red guy is that classic example. And I can't believe it's all at 20 years old. He's that example of uh, uh, like an overnight success taking like a lot of time. The, mm. the stuff that thread guy was doing before he even got into the NFT space, like trading cards and all these other things where the story is so clear and you're like, wow, this guy was hustling like, and he was learning like in high school and like all the way through. And, and sneakers and you look back and you're like it all makes sense and it, <laughs> each thing built upon the next and it's like i don't know i mean the the uh he's exactly like that that story of folks just hustling and grinding and building skills and then like one day it happens and and for him it happened you know when he bet on himself to to drop out of school and 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 build his account and his account obviously has now i think he's got what like seventy five thousand followers and and yeah that's the beginning for him this is okay this is an interesting question that i just thought of um when you're trying to because obviously it seems it appears to be crucial to find the right people and clearly you're blown away by thread guy and have awesome things to say about him i'd love to have him on to tell his story as well um what do you look for then because you, I, I don't know at what stage you maybe started building this organic relationship whether that was kind of before the success that he's now kind of achieved or in the notoriety but how how influential do you think the numbers are? Well, like when you see someone with seventy five thousand followers, they obviously are far more. They're in a far stronger position at that time, and you might start to think, okay, this would be a good hire because they have the numbers, right? But do you, do you think that you're able to see the potential in those people far earlier? Do you think that's relevant, or do you just throw all that stuff out the window and be like, look, we we think we believe in your story, we think that's good and you, we think you'd be a good fit i think uh you know followers are like a bonus and if you have them that's like awesome uh we would we would never i guess the red guy's position is a little bit unique as a director vibes like you want mm. you want someone for sure like with with a platform and i think most of them do um a good example is like op our head of engineering who who vj just mentioned who's like uh just so essential for our team i think created a twitter like after we hired him um, so <laughs> it's like definitely not necessary at all. Um, yeah. 
one thing that that I do think the team does really well across all functions is um, we all like tweet tweet a good bit and we all tweet insight into Tally Labs, why we do what we do when we launch new products. We, we talk about the process that we you know, we launch them across functionally. Um, so I do think that that level of like um, of, a, of a glimpse into an organization is, is important. And it's sometimes important to do that from like non company channels just to really like let people in. And, and we love that transparency. So. I think it's it's definitely something that that we do at Tally Labs, but um, there would never be an instance where like we have an awesome candidate who like doesn't have a lot of followers, and we would we would say no. Um, uh, um, yeah, if that answers your question, I think like yeah. having them is great, and like it's another outlet to speak to the community, but um, but by no means like a requirement. Definitely, I think so. We're talking a lot here about like the kind of business element or operational side of things and hiring people. At what point, uh, this, this is a conversation I've heard a lot at the moment where people are kind of frustrated by NFT projects as opposed to these projects like not becoming NFT businesses. And I wonder when did you think, how early in your sphere or did you mm-hmm. think, okay, this we're going to turn this into a full-blown business and how did you do that? Because I think that's that transition is what everyone is struggling with right now. Yeah, um, uh, that's really well said. The way you talk about that, that um, like crossing over from a project to a business. Uh, for us, it was the very beginning. Um, at, at, we posted the stories as Jenkins. We The first origin story, then we posted a form. Hundreds of apes wrote in. They wanted us to tell their story. We continued to post stories. They continued to go well. And it became clear to us fairly quickly within weeks that there was an opportunity to do something that could have like greater scale than just posting content onto Twitter. Um, that was that was how the idea for the writer's room came up. And, and Saf and I, ha, you know, are both, you know, fairly entrepreneurial um, where we love business. Like we, you, you know, we care a lot about it. We couldn't imagine like if we if we weren't doing this, we would be doing something else. But like, you know, thank goodness it's this because this is like everything to us. But uh, I think, you know, I say that because we, from the very beginning, we, um, Safa mentioned earlier, I think like we, we often ask ourselves like, what if it goes right? Like, like what if things are, are successful? What would we want to be true? And so uh, we were incredibly buttoned up on legal, on accounting, um, you know, incorporating the entity uh, imagining all the things that would have to be true about uh, a business. And we made sure that that was good to go before we, before we really ever even started to, to outwardly market the concept of the writer's room. Um, Safa so also wise. mentioned that the writer. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. I'm I mean, a, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer previously. I've set oh, up cool. like a bunch yeah. of companies already <laughs> in, in advance for, for all this yeah. stuff as well. I mean, we were also fortunate, right, to have like, um, you know, careers that allowed us to have like some disposable income. So for us, like the worst case scenario was that we spent a couple thousand bucks on all of it and, and, and we were out. But like, uh, if you think about it on like a 10 year time horizon, spending that money is like you amortize it over the course of a bunch of tries, right? And at some point you're like, you know, it all ends up worth it or something. Um, and, and so for us, we, we just knew from day one that we wanted this to be a business and Safa's point earlier was that, you know, we were like a utility project in a sea of PFP projects. Mm. The utility project was the gated writer's room. The gated writer's room was this place where people could collaborate to like make content. That was just like the MVP of a broader vision that you now see sort of beginning to come to market at, at its next level of fidelity in Azerbala and in all of the other things that we're doing. And so the the writer's room was always the first and like the genesis project that came from an NFT business rather than an NFT project that may or may not go well that we had to then figure out like where mm. does it go from here? Yeah. Um yeah, I think I think the you know just preparing for like and planning for like what if it goes right, how would you want this to be set up is really the key. That's so so profound in a sense because it's also in a way it's kind of so optimistic it's just like you know in a way you wonder why like why is everyone not thinking it's gonna go well like if this was to go well would you not want this stuff to be protected under you know 
incorporated properly as a company, you're going to have all the liability on your head. If you've got business partners, there's going to be like, how are you going to split it up? Are you all individuals? Have you kind of got some weird corporate um, joint partnership? It just, it takes care of it. But I guess people don't want to do that thinking and sometimes it can slow business down. And actually this kind of goes on to my next question, which is how I, I can see how it's slow business down when it's people who you don't know and you're kind of teasing out mm-hmm. partnerships and being like, can I trust you this and that? So how influential has it been for the two of you uh, having such a long standing connection in being able to go about this together? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're best friends. Um, like I, just like in my head right now, I'm, I can think about the third grade and, and, and being together and uh, what that meant and what it's always meant to us and our, our corporate council in the early days, like before we were even a company, but we were setting all this stuff up. We, we sort of had some questions for each other. We had a, uh, he was, he was setting up the entity and we had some questions for him about what it would mean. And, and um, uh, his answers like didn't really matter to us. And we expressed that like, like, like the specific thing we were working through. I don't even really remember what it was, but he said, you can't litigate trust. Um, and, uh, and that's the, that is us. Like it, it, yeah. uh, I don't ever worry about any of it because, because we're best friends. Like, and, and that, that, that supersedes all of it. And that's wrapped and shot through the entire business. Um, and it, some people might say like, don't go into business with your friends, but, um, they haven't gone into business with Safa. <laughs> I see what you did there, VJ. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> uh be check that that's uh do you care if i say it you... no that's fine no 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 that, go for that, it. that's a that's a uh that's a, a quote from uh the best man speech that i gave at vj's wedding uh ah. about, about two months ago except safa was replaced with vj it was smooth <laughs> as hell <laughs> very nice off the cuff uh yeah no i mean i i think the point is is not lost on anyone like when i was speaking to it was one of my biggest takeaways when I spoke to, I met Mando and OSF separately and they also were very good friends from, uh, from, from work pre- in their previous lifetime. And one of the first things Mando is like, you've got to find someone, man. Like you've got to find someone to do this stuff with. Cause it's just so hard to attack this stuff alone. Like to try to build something substantial in this space with the way things move. It's just like really, really hard. Um, and so, yeah, I, I fortunately did actually meet someone who I, I got along with very well. But awesome. I can, but I can see how having this long-standing relationship where you just don't need to question certain things, it's just like that's got to be a huge, huge advantage. Yeah, it's it's made its way into like the culture of the team too. Like, like mm. everyone on the team is really close and really tight knit, and and you know, I think friends for life. Um, and I don't like I don't want to say that like that's because of us. I think it's because of like the awesome people that that, that we have on the team. But certainly, um, it's it's. I mean, it's it's it permeates throughout the whole the whole company, top to bottom. Yeah, I can I can see that. Um, so it's, you you just mentioned Azabala again, and this kind of focus on storytelling. Um, what what can we expect as as you've kind of move into this next stage of the development of your business? Yeah. I mean, on Azerbala specifically, uh, our hope is that you can expect like a merging and a meshing of like community and, and team in a way that like you haven't before. Um, you can, you can imagine, you know, uh, well, one, we have an incredibly active base of, of holders. I think it even exceeds what we expected it would be at this point, right? Like PFPs are not live yet. There's, you know, 50 to 60 characters that have been created businesses that have been created and, and ways that people are bringing Azerbala to life in their own way using like, you know, mid journey assets that they're posting on Twitter. Like it's, it's crazy. And so we're seeing that and we're thinking, okay, how can we build for these folks? And we believe mm-hmm. like when you, when fan fiction, isn't this like thing that's cast off to the side for the sake of like official lore, but rather it's things that sort of like um, build on top of each other. And, and mm-hmm. we can take inspiration from them in the same way that, that they do from us. So I think, you know, you can expect it to be like a real sort of community generative world where the things that the people do 
uh, and the characters that they build and the business that they, that they create actually feel like they're having real impact on, on Azerbala rather than like, it's just kind of this thing that's happening on the side. Um, and that happens through software experiences that we're seeing that we need to build based on how people are acting as well as storytelling and making sure that we're, uh, we're giving them sort of the shine that, that they deserve. And, um, a thesis that we have is, and it's why we think BAYC was so successful and, and is so successful because they have the, the largest, I don't have any data behind this. It's just a hunch. They have the largest sort of, um, like per capita sort of, uh, entrepreneurial, like creative bunch who are actually doing stuff with their IP. And we believe mm-hmm. that if we can tap into that with Azerbala and we can have as equally a large sort of per capita of people bringing their characters to life, then that's going to make for like a successful PFP. And so we're, we're like building a bunch of stuff to enable that. That's, um, that sounds really, really exciting. I'm planning on diving in a lot more. Um, look guys, I, I could ask you a whole host of other questions, but I'm conscious of time. I just want to close by asking, uh, both of you, um, for what would your top piece of advice be for people looking to try to turn that corner from being an NFT project to an NFT business? Um, I would say, uh, look at, um, look at what your project does and, um, look at what makes web three or nfts like special there's a number of different things there's digital scarcity there's the fact the blockchain is like a public database so there's interoperability or composability there's a number of different sort of things that make this space unique and different than like doing something outside of the space (laughs) and um and so really reflect on like what it was about the project that you brought to market that was like that was made special and um figure out how you can work with your community to like keep double clicking on that thing that is special and and refining that thing and and figuring out what it is that like that you and your your core community really cares about um and and then keep chasing that thing down that's awesome safa I don't have much to add besides that. I mean, um, it's funny because even the largest NFT projects in the world still say, still say, I mean, I just said it, they still say project, right? Like sometimes you'll hear mm. you guys will say like project and you're like, well, that's a, four <laughs> like, billion, this is a billion dollar, dollar company. Yeah. You know, it's not a project. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're in this interesting space where even the oldest companies who are seeing the most success are like 15 months old, right? Which is so incredibly young. So mm. above all, like just excited to kind of see how things shake out. But um one thing that VJ said, which, which we, we do say a lot is like, uh, instead of thinking like, you know, how, like what, what happens if this doesn't go well, you know, if you're starting a project, then, you know, I would challenge yourself to, to say what happens if this goes exactly how I hope it goes. And, and, and even, even more than that, right? Like there's no possible way that the Yuga founders could have conceptualized where they are now versus where they started. Like so many little things had to happen to then even be able to conceptualize where they are. And so planning for that, making sure that you're structurally set up properly and that if you do sort of catch lightning in a bottle, you're not then having to double back and do all of those administrative things that you forgot to do or you're opening yourself up to liability. So just, you know, doing doing whatever you can to like allow yourself to actually capture the momentum that, that you hopefully get if like the art and the messaging and the, the software and, and everything is is right, you know, and the timing, of course. I, I love that positive, optimistic kind of outlook and as a default way of thinking so i think we'll close there um if we do want to keep in touch with what's going on and keep abreast of the next set of updates where's the best place to keep in the know um jenkins of la on twitter uh at azerbala on twitter with one l there's a current currently an imposter with two l's who's 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 sending people to a malicious link um, there's discord accounts for both, um, Jenkins of LA.com, Azerbala.com, uh, at tally labs, NFT. Um, we have so many Twitter accounts. I could go down the list and give you every Azarian legend, good boy, the mutant, I think, but I won't. <laughs> I, some, some, someone tweeted at us this morning and they I tagged, I, I think there tweet. were like five Twitter. Yeah. 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 Like, <laughs> how many Twitter accounts do you have? It was like at least 10 more that you didn't tag. Yeah. <laughs> 
All right, I'll, I'll, well, I'll put all those main ones in the, in the links so people can check it out. But appreciate the time, guys. Uh, really great conversation. And, and at Valet Jones and at C8 Follow Ape as well, which I forgot to mention. Absolutely. I'll include both. Thanks a lot, guys. Great convo. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Thank you.